Hi, my name is Melissa. These are my daughters, Caitlin and Alyssa. And on this beautiful Easter morning, we would like to welcome you to Rockford Baptist Church. And from our family to your family, we would like to say, Happy Easter. Mark 16, 5, 6. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe on the right side, and they were alarmed. Do not be afraid. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene. He has been crucified, and he is risen. He is not here. See the place that he, they laid him? Happy Resurrection! Happy, Happy Easter! Easter. Happy Easter, everyone. We trust you're all doing well. What crazy times we've been living in. We want to let you know we've been playing lots of board games recently, doing some baking, and playing a lot outside as well. During these times, a lot of things are crazy, but we want to focus on God's promises. Today, we'd like to share with you a verse from Genesis 28, verse 15. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. We miss you. We miss meeting as a church family. What a weird way to celebrate Easter today. But we hope to see you real soon. We want to say, Happy Easter. He is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Happy Easter, RBC. From the Styles family. He is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Well, I would like to say good morning from the Adams family. We know it's been very difficult to not physically be together with the ones we love, especially on an Easter Sunday. But we can still come together as a church and worship together in one body and in spirit. So let's take this time just to praise God together. He has risen. He has risen indeed. If you would noticed, our friend Goliath has come to join us today, and he wants to tell you why this day is important to him. Why it's Graham Rowland's birthday. Yay! And Goliath, it's Pat's birthday today, too. Oh, come on now. We know those days are important and they're special, too. But that's really not the reason that we come to celebrate Easter. We celebrate Easter because that is the day that Jesus rose from the grave, and he is our risen Savior. We miss everyone, and we're looking forward to being back together again soon. Pat. Kathy. Goliath. Saying goodbye for now. Hey, RBC, uh, I figure you guys get to see the dialed up version of Jake every week, so we thought you would uh, show you a little bit of what real life in the Lang household is. Hi, this is Levi's house, and he loves to crawl back and forth. Carter, what is your favorite thing to do during quiet? Tablet! Tablet time? You just love playing on your tablet? Too much. Too much, that is probably true. <laughs> Hi, RBC family, we love you guys so much, and we miss Hi, you. Um, and I hope that you guys are having a fun time with your families, um, spending some extra time with them during this time. Yeah. Hey, put the tablet down. We, uh, we've been trying to get a lot of extra time together as a family, going on bike rides, playing outside, and we, uh, just hope that you guys are doing the same and that this will hopefully give you guys, uh, kind of some new perspectives on what's important in life and, uh, get to enjoy some of that together. Carter, who do you want to say hi to? Hi, Bonita. Yeah, yeah. Miss Bonita, what about? Hi, Miss Amy. <laughs> so we love you guys. We miss you. We hope you have a wonderful Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Yeah, yeah. way to go, Good buddy. Job. <laughs> Greetings from Steve and Denise Danagelis. We just want to wish you a happy Easter. Uh, we miss our church family. We're looking forward to the time that we can get back together again. In the meantime, make sure you practice social distancing, wash your hands, and wear your mask when you're out. 
She's the nurse. Listen to her. <laughs> and I really miss everybody <clears throat> from the bottom of my heart. And uh, I guess this would be the Greek in me. I'm uh, I'm wishing everybody a happy Easter. Uh, saying uh, Christos, that's Christ. Anesti, Christ is risen. And any any Greek that uh, that hears that greeting is going to say Aethos Anesti. Meaning, indeed, he is risen, and he provides the hope of our salvation. And uh, we really, uh, we're starting to go stir-crazy here, and we can't wait to see everybody and get together and do all those activities. Love you all. We'll see you. Bye. Bye.
washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Really my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he faithfully wore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when that was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new, now life began. Rockford Baptist friends and family on this joyous Easter Sunday. No, it's a little different here, isn't it? But wasn't it good to just see some familiar faces? Uh, people in uh, the congregation, so glad they were able to send us uh, some of their video clips. Today we're going to be uh, talking about a very familiar character in the Bible. 
His name was Thomas, and I would invite you to open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 20. We're going to be looking at verses 19 through 29. And Thomas, if you could use one word to describe Thomas, what would it be? Doubting, right? Doubting Thomas. And to be honest, I feel a little bad for Thomas. Other disciples didn't get named for their faults. I mean, Peter had a problem with fear, but he didn't get labeled Petrified Peter or Peter the Pansy or anything like that. But Thomas got named and commemorated for his flaw. So let's read about this passage this morning, John chapter 20, starting with verse 19. It says, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Verse 24 says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I seal the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who who have not seen and yet have believed. Now let me just talk a little bit about the passage leading up to this section of verses. Mary Magdalene, one of Jesus' followers, had gone to the tomb early on Sunday morning. She went to anoint Jesus, and when she got there, she found the stone was rolled away. She assumed that someone had stolen the body and ran back to tell the other disciples. Peter and John then ran to the tomb to check it out. Peter went all the way in the tomb and found no body, only Jesus' headscarf neatly folded up and laid on the bench, it says in John 20, verse 7, which indicated first that this wasn't a burglar, because burglars usually don't take time to fold clothes after they steal things, do they? And it leads Peter to conclude that a miracle had truly happened. Two miracles, in fact. The first is that Jesus had resurrected from the tomb. And the second miracle is a single man had taken the time to actually make his bed. For all you parents, I know we've been on this the last couple weeks, trying to get your kids to make their beds. I think this is a good reason why they should make their beds each morning. Just tell your kids, look, Jesus had risen from the dead and he still took time to make his bed. So you kids have no excuses at all. Well, later that night, Jesus appeared to the disciples and he showed himself to them. But Thomas, he wasn't there. He'd probably gone out on a Starbucks run for everybody. We don't know where exactly he was, but he was not there. So when Thomas gets back, they told him, hey guys, we, we've seen Jesus. But Thomas says, oh no, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe it. Now honestly, this has to be at the top of the list of things that you regret saying, doesn't it? Think about it. I mean, we've all said stupid things before and we've gotten embarrassed by it, haven't we? But eventually, after a day or two, everybody just kind of forgets about it. Well, Thomas says something stupid, and it's written down in the Bible for us to read for the next 2,000 years. Here's the reason why I feel bad for Thomas. I mean, lots of people in the Gospels doubted. Jesus' cousin, for example, John the Baptist. Jesus actually called him the greatest prophet to ever have lived. He got confused because Jesus didn't seem to be bringing in the kingdom as quickly as John had expected. So John sent a message to Jesus in Luke chapter 7, verse 19. He says, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? 
Even John the Baptist had doubts at times. Think of the Old Testament. Think of Job. He has a book named after him that is essentially 37 chapters of him confessing his doubts to God. One of my favorites, the Gospel of Matthew, tells us that after Jesus had resurrected and had appeared several times to his disciples, he gathered them on the mountainside and began to ascend into heaven. Matthew 28, verse 17 says this, says, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. How crazy is that? Jesus floating in midair, and some of the apostles are going, yeah, I don't really know. I think I'm going to keep my religious affiliation as none for now. It's like, come on, guys, you guys still have your doubts? The point is, lots of people doubted even in the Bible, not just Thomas. But only Thomas gets the name. And that's probably because so many people can identify with Thomas. And I really believe that John here highlights Thomas' story at the end of his gospel. And I believe he does this is because he sees Thomas as the example of how those of us who struggle sometimes to believe can learn to do so. So look at verse 26. It says, A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Which is a little ironic, isn't it? Because if a guy you think is dead suddenly shows up in the middle of a locked room, the last thing you would probably feel is peace. I mean, I would be sort of freaked out here. But verse 27 says, Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. So here's a question. How did Jesus even know to say these specific things to Thomas? He hadn't been there when Thomas had said these things earlier. It's because the resurrected Jesus is omniscient. Fancy word for for meaning he knows everything. He's also omnipresent, meaning he is everywhere at once. In Thomas, at this point, sensing Jesus' deity, he falls prostrate before him and says, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So let's just look quickly at a couple of observations that we can find in this passage. The first is, Thomas was a doubter. But let's be honest, many people are today. Let's just ask, why was Thomas so skeptical? I mean, ten of his trusted friends all told him they'd seen the exact same thing. Why was Thomas so cynical? Why was he so slow to believe? Well, a couple of reasons. The first is, dead people don't get up out of the grave, do they? That was as unbelievable back then as it would be today. (laughs) And the Jewish people had really no category for this. They weren't looking for a crucified and resurrected Messiah. When we look at kind of the context of what they were looking for back then is they were looking for a conquering, victorious leader. And they thought if God was really at work in Jesus Christ here, then surely it wouldn't have ended with Jesus being shamed and dying on a cross alone. And second, when Jesus died, he shattered every category Thomas had for what God was supposed to do. In Thomas's day, the Jewish people were under cruel and unjust Roman persecution. So Thomas, like most Jews, expected the Messiah to come and to crush the Romans. Isn't that what a fair and compassionate God would do? But Jesus had shown up preaching mercy to the Romans and telling the Jews to be kind to them, to turn the other cheek, to love their enemies. And then he had died in seemingly weakness and shame. And Thomas really had no category for this, a dying Messiah or a suffering God. Thomas wanted to believe, but his mind was just confused and his heart had been broken. And may I ask for us today, Do you find yourself sometimes saying, I really, truly want to believe, 
But the ways of God are often confusing. I just can't understand them. Especially during difficult times like these. You ask, why would God allow this to happen? Or where is God in all this seemingly craziness that we are experiencing today? And honestly, maybe your doubt and confusion this morning may be a little different than Thomas's. You might not be asking questions about Roman oppression. Maybe you think some of these things that the Bible teaches just seem to be a little confusing. Or they seem to be a little hard to believe. Honestly, we all have questions, don't we? You're like maybe in the Old Testament with with Noah. Really? A worldwide flood? God put one family on a boat and, and came all these animals two by two? Or Joshua and the army, they sang to Jericho and the walls actually fell down? Or maybe it's the presence of difficult biblical teachings like hell. I mean, how could a loving and just God send people to hell? Or questions of why, if there's a loving God, why is there so much pain? Why do we go through so much suffering in our world today? Or maybe you just honestly hear the Christian message and think, really? I mean, let's be honest, for those of us who have grown up in the church ever since we were young, we're just kind of used to these churchy things. But imagine if you've never been to church before in your entire life, and you come and you you hear this gospel message about a guy who was born 2,000 years ago who saved the world by dying, and he brought peace on earth, even though there doesn't seem to be a lot of peace on earth today, does there? But the Bible says that one day he's going to come back again to restore peace by riding through the clouds on a white horse. And you think, what's so hard to believe about that, right? We all have different questions, don't we? But to Thomas and to every real doubter, Jesus gives an answer. But let me warn you, it's not what you may think. It's not an explanation but it is a revelation. Not so much an answer to the questions, but he gives us a glimpse of who Jesus truly is, proven by what he did. So here's what we can learn about the development of faith from the story of Thomas here. The first is this, two points this morning. The first is our faith is anchored not in an explanation, but it's in an event. Jesus didn't really address the substance of uh, Thomas' doubts. Instead, he comforts him with the fact of his resurrection. He invited Thomas to touch the scars on his hands. And you know, when you think about it, Christianity didn't begin with people who believed something, but with people who saw something. Jesus urged Thomas to believe because of what he had proven by his resurrection. We think of the foundation of the church was not what the apostles taught, but it was what Jesus did. If he did not raise from the dead, then our faith is useless, isn't it? We Christians should be the most pitied people on the planet. But what we believe to be true in the Bible was authorized, was given to us by Jesus, who had proven he had authority by raising from the dead, by conquering sin. Now, of course, many of us would say, well, you know, if I were Thomas and I got to see firsthand what he saw, I would believe too. Jesus acknowledged that Thomas got a privileged view. He says, because you have seen me, you have believed. And we all wish we could see Jesus face to face, don't we? And and through his word, he tells us one day we will. But let me encourage you this morning. We have compelling evidence today for his resurrection. Let me ask you this. What else but Jesus' actual resurrection could explain the behavior of these disciples and the events of the first century? Think of the early Christian movement was begun by a group of people, the apostles and their friends, who went to the ends of the earth proclaiming that they had seen Jesus risen from the grave. It cost them everything. They were cast out. They were persecuted. They were impoverished. 
Just think of how many of those early apostles died a martyr's death. What would compel them to do this other than their genuine belief in the resurrection? Thomas would go on, by the way, to be one of the first martyrs for his faith. Pretty reliable evidence indicates that Thomas took the gospel to India and was martyred there for his faith. Or think of just the many other different apostles. Think of the transformation in Peter's life. He once denied Jesus three times on the night before his death. Ask yourself, would Peter, who denied the living Jesus, have been willing to die for one who he knew was truly dead? 1 Corinthians, which is one of the earliest books in the New Testament, written about 20 years after Jesus' death, Paul says that everything in Christianity rises or falls with the resurrection. He points to 500 people who were still alive that Jesus had appeared to simultaneously. And he names a few of them and he says, if you have any doubts, go talk to them. You get the point by now, the resurrection was not just a legend that got added in over time. It was the core message of Christianity from the beginning. The German historian Pannenberg says, The evidence for Jesus' resurrection is so strong that nobody would question it except for two things. The first is it was. It was a very unusual event. And second, he says, if you believed it happened, you have to change the way you live. Christ's resurrection changed everything, didn't it? Which leads to a second truth that we find in John, and that is there is even better knowledge that comes through direct experience. I mean, imagine for a moment here that you've been blind your whole life, and through a miraculous procedure, you were healed and you could see light. How do you know that you are now in the light? It's not that you can logically prove the existence of light. It's because you can now see everything else because of that light. And John opens up his gospel by saying Jesus was the light that came into the world. It says God's word became flesh and dwelled among us. And we beheld his glory, the kind of glory that could only belong to God. In Jesus, John says, we see a being of such unparalleled moral beauty that we know he has to be God. We see one whose passion to do the will of his Father was even more essential for him than food. We see one who never sought his own glory, but always sought his Father's glory, even to the point of death. In him we see what true love is. We see a God who possesses the power that could walk on top of the waves, that could heal the blind and the sick, that could cast out demons. But in the end, he gave himself in a great act of love to save those who rejected him. The love and the beauty displayed in his life was so glorious and so unique to the human race that we know it had to be God. Look what Jesus said the proof of his life was. John 7, 18 says, The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Jesus basically said his life was his proof of who he was. I love what Pastor John Piper says. He does not make sense. He brings sense to the world. He is sense. He is the light. And in his light, we see everything else. And that's what we see here in John's gospel. <laughs> it's incredible. I love another story that we see here is, is a, a story of a blind man who, who Jesus miraculously healed. And he was an uneducated man, and, and all these professors at the time, these educated people, they get a hold of this guy, and they start asking him all these questions. And they start raising all these intellectual problems with his healing. <laughs> and the guy finally just gets frustrated and exasperated, and he says, Look, I don't know the answer to all your guys' questions. 
I don't even know the, the meaning of half the words you guys are using. But what I do know is this. I once was blind, and now I see. <laughs> you see, we could lay out all the evidence for the resurrection, but how can you argue with a changed life, a transformed life? I want you to just think for a moment here. Remember your life before you came to Christ. And then just think back when that first time the, the gospel truly sunk in and that incredible peace that you felt. And you know that this peace could not be offered in any of the things that the world offers, but it's only what Jesus Christ could offer. And you found an end to that endless thirst that you had in your soul. In Christ, you finally learned a humility that didn't crave exalting itself all the time, but it actually delighted in giving the glory to God. In Jesus Christ, you can taste the glory of God, and you know that he is the truth, and you can be confident in what he says. So let me just challenge us this morning. Who do you say that Jesus Christ is? Was he just a great moral guy? Was he just a great religious teacher? Or is he who he said he was, the Son of God, who descended and left the glories of heaven to come down to live on this earth to save us? Maybe you're like Thomas this morning. You might have questions. And I have to be honest, we all have questions, don't we? We all have questions and doubts. But in your heart, you know that Jesus is truly the Son of God and that he rose from the dead. You know that to be true this morning. I want to invite you to follow him, to trust him, and let him answer your questions as you go. He's got all eternity for that. According to Jesus, what it says in his word is that we are all sinful. We are all separated from God. And our sin is the root of all our problems in life. But it says that Jesus came because he cared for us, because he loved us. John 1.12 says, Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the rights to become children of God. So are you ready to confess Jesus like Thomas? Lord, I have questions but I believe you are my Lord and my God, and I am ready to receive you. So I would just ask this morning, would you just bow with me in prayer? And I just ask, if you have not made that decision this morning, that you would do that. And Father, as we come to you, we are so thankful for what you did on the cross for our salvation. And we know that although um, that was such a dark moment of the sin of all of us was laid on your shoulders and you were laid into that tomb. But we know that you conquered the grave and you rose again. And we are just so thankful for the salvation that you have given by taking our sins on the cross. And as we've mentioned Thomas this morning, some of us may have some different questions and doubts. But I pray that each one of us would just see through your word the truth <laughs> that you are truly the Son of God and you are the only one who can bring salvation to us. And I pray if you have not made that decision this morning that you would accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and that you would see through personal experience what Jesus can do through a changed life. So I pray that you would just receive him and believe in his name. And as this verse in John says, he will give you the right to become a child of God. And you can have the confidence and the peace that you can live eternally with him. I pray these things in your name. Amen.
just wanted to take some time up uh, again to thank you guys for tuning in. We hope that you are having a wonderful Easter, even though it's probably different than any other Easter that you've ever had before. Uh, we want to remind you of ways to continue giving to the church if you would desire to do so. You can mail in checks, uh, you can set up payments through your bank, or we also have online giving. And like we said before, all of that information can be found at rockfordbaptist.org slash donate. And in particular, in a time like this, I just want to encourage you guys as families to come up with some unique ways to be generous. And not just to the church, uh, but to your neighbors, to those that you know that are in need, um, and to just the many nonprofits in our area that are struggling to keep up with the, de the increased demand, uh, but also at the same time receiving less donations because so many are in some financial hardships. So if you are somebody that's really just struggling right now to pay the bills, you've gotten laid off, um, you need to just kind of provide for your own needs, that's understandable. But I know for our, myself and for many others out there, uh, we're still doing okay. Uh, so I want to encourage you guys to kind of just find some unique ways to be generous during this time. You know, for example, Sarah and I uh, just today were looking at kind of our own budget and saying, okay, are there some ways that we can be generous, uh, Kids Food Basket put out a, a notice to the news stations a few days ago that they're just really in need of support right now because of all the extra meals that they're doing. And so we were looking at our own budget and go, hey, you know what? Gas. We're not driving anywhere right now. And even when we are driving anywhere, gas prices are way down. So maybe we could take some of that money that we usually spend on gas and, and donate that to somebody. So I encourage you guys as families, you know, look, sit down, look at your budgets. Maybe it's that you go out for coffee regularly and you're not doing that anymore. What are some ways that you can be generous with what God has blessed you with during this time when there's so many around us that are in need, uh, whether that be your neighbors, your friends, your family, or giving to one of these organizations that's serving? So we encourage you guys to do that. I'm going to close us with a benediction from Hebrews chapter 13. It says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. We pray you have a blessed Easter, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.